Welcome to the Smoke Pit, a behind-the-scenes episode. This video is being made to address my analysis of a subscriber story, which was shared in the Smoke Pit episode titled, Too Close for Comfort. That, and I suppose to generally inform you about the type of research I conduct into both the Bizarre War stories, as well as the personal stories that are shared here on the channel. Now, because this type of thing could take time away from making new episodes, I don't plan to make a habit of doing this for every story, but I suppose I thought it would be the right thing to do in this case, with Chad's permission, using his story as an example. For those of you who have shared your stories with me so far, and for those considering it, by no means is this video meant to discourage you in any way from doing so. I understand that many of your stories have already been met with enough unfair skepticism, and that is not my intention. Quite the contrary, in fact. I simply want to address the subject of integrity and transparency, and why I consider these to be important. Of course, I have already stated in the Smoke Pit introduction video that I do not want anyone sending me a story they know is fictional or intentionally embellished, and then misrepresenting it as being true. All of that being said, as long as I can find a place for your story in the Smoke Pit series, I will likely have no problem sharing most of the stories I get, and I'm very grateful that you would take the time and effort to share them with me and with the audience. But dependent on the story, I certainly hope you don't mind if I respond to your stories with any number of questions, both for the sake of clarifying your story, asking for details that will be used when creating the animations more accurately, and of course to point out any possible inconsistencies or contradictions I find that need to be sorted out. As with my initial experience speaking to Robert over the last year about his various experiences from seeing Bigfoot and UFOs on Fort Campbell to a giant snake in Honduras, I make no bones about admitting that I don't know much about anything outside of my own experiences, and I try to remain very open-minded when it comes to believing the unbelievable no matter how bizarre a story is. And as grateful as I am to have all of you sharing your stories, I still can't just bypass my own initial feelings of skepticism when an extraordinary story involves multiple strange events and without additional explanation, you know, it's a story that can appear a little too convenient. So, much like Robert and Xavier's more detailed stories of bizarre encounters, multiple bizarre encounters. After Chad emailed me his story, I did attempt to make a respectful effort to push back against the story to see if it held up to scrutiny. And what did I find? Well, that's where things might get a little creepy. Because, like Robert's and Xavier's stories, my findings are what made me feel comfortable in sharing Chad's story in the first place. You know, I, I wouldn't have spent all of the time creating the animations and, you know, talking to him and, and following up with him and everything if I didn't have a reason to take him seriously. Uh, in other words, what I found does appear to offer some credibility to what he was telling me, at least to the effect that I can confidently say that he was completely honest about everything that I could prove Bob Lazar might be a good example of a man who is known to have had a deliberate effort made against him to discredit him and his story about UFOs and his observations at Area 51. Those working against him knew that if he couldn't even prove that he worked at the government facilities and departments he claimed to work at, how could anyone be expected to take his story seriously? Now, I'm just a guy making YouTube videos, and I'm greatly limited by both time and my available resources. But as an example, when someone shares with me a story that involves real places and provides details about those places, I will use what research tools I have available to verify the accuracy of those details and to look for inconsistencies in how these actual places are described. And if someone sends me a story and is very vague about these details regarding specific locations, if I think it's important to do so, oftentimes for the sake of creating the animations, I will respectfully ask them to provide those details. Now, in Chad's case, nowhere in his first email did he tell me where he lived. 
or even what state he lived in. I can respect that because I have no reason to question someone's right to privacy. And even if I had believed his story right away, I still expected that he may have otherwise used a fake name and even a throwaway email address to protect his identity. One small note here, while I do wish to make my best effort to present these personal stories in the most credible way that I can out of respect for both my audience's time in listening to these stories and the trust that they offer me in doing my research, at the end of the day, I am likely not going to intentionally push someone beyond their comfort zone, such as asking to speak with their family members directly. Um, however, because of the extraordinary nature of Chad's story, I, I would not have shared his story, much like Robert and Xavier's, if I could not at least verify that he was who he said he was, even if he later asked me to exclude mentioning any personal information for the sake of maintaining his privacy. But although he never mentioned where he lived in the first email he sent me, Chad had included the photo he mentioned, a picture he claimed that he took of his second sighting of this UFO, just outside his neighborhood right before he turned onto his street. And that is the picture you see here. This photo was really the only piece of evidence I had to verify anything he was saying. And at first glance, my initial impression was that the object in this photo could be anything. A plane or some other metallic aircraft reflecting sunlight. And ultimately, my first question was, how could I know if he even took the photo himself? Well, what Chad didn't know when he sent me this photo was that his cell phone had geotagged it logging the GPS point at which the photo was taken, and that the photo also had an additional amount of other pieces of metadata attached to it. So, I plugged the GPS coordinates into Google Earth. Now, because he didn't offer to mention where he lived, I thought even he would consider this level of investigation a little bit creepy, so of course I did let him know that I did this investigation after the fact, before obviously publishing his story, and he did state that he was comfortable with me sharing all of this research with you, minus the personally identifiable information, of course. So, what did I find? Well, in his email, he said the photo was taken on October 4th, 2019, in the morning, after he dropped his sons off at school and was returning home. The metadata proved that to be entirely true. As you can see here, the photo was taken October 4th, 2019, at 7.19 a.m., and the location. Well, for the sake of his privacy, of course, I'm not going to disclose the GPS coordinates, but yes, the coordinates were exactly where he described taking the photo, right in the middle of this highway, where instead of making a left turn onto his street, he pulled off onto this white-lined, narrow median section of the road. Exactly as he described, he was parked in this section of road when he took the photo. With that information, along with using public real estate records and cross-referencing that information with public sites such as LinkedIn, uh, based on the job that he said he, you know, he had, I was likewise able to verify that Chad was who he said he was, that he had used his real name, and that he does in fact live just down the street from where this photo was taken. So I am fairly certain he took the photo. As for the object in the photo, well, Clearly, there isn't much we can tell since it's just a bright object off in the distance, and even he acknowledged that, you know, the photo wasn't great quality and it doesn't really portray the appearance of the first UFO that he saw. But using a few simple tools, I was otherwise able to confirm that the photo had not been edited or altered in any way. So whatever he took a photo of, I am confident that it is an original photo taken with his iPhone exactly where and when he said he took it. And there is something else I noticed. Because of its distance, Chad appears to have used his cell phone's digital zoom to try and get a closer shot of this UFO, and as such, the photo quality is much lower. But when I zoom in on the object, although it's pixelated, the shape does not seem to be round, as a star or planet would probably appear in the sky and it does seem to match the distinctive football-shaped description he gave for the first UFO he saw. Now, if this was a video, we could of course verify that the object was remaining stationary, as opposed to being a plane or other aircraft in flight. But considering the oval 
or football shape of the object as well as the sheer brightness of it, it seems unlikely that this is a helicopter or plane. Unless we wanted to claim that some part of an aircraft, like a window, caused a glaring flash of sunlight at precisely the same moment he took the photo and that the glare completely obscured the rest of the aircraft. I did consider that a possibility, but then the question I would have is why the man would have wanted to take a photo of something if it wasn't something he thought was unusual. Remember, as proven by the GPS coordinates, he had deliberately parked his car in a relatively dangerous spot in the middle of a highway, you know, on his way home, right? Why, you know, he could have just turned into his street if he needed to stop the car for something. The GPS coordinates were extremely precise, literally down to the quadrillionth decimal point. He was parked right there in the middle of the highway. I imagine that people driving by him probably would have thought his car had broken down. Would he do that just to take a picture of an ordinary airplane or helicopter flying in the distance? It's possible, but it makes no sense to me. So I'm inclined to believe that he did see something unusual and stopped to take a photo of it. Now, obviously, we will have to take Chad on his word about the dream he described having. That and the first UFO sighting, which eh, might be a big thing to ask for uh, as far as believing him. But considering he didn't lie about anything else, and given my general impression after speaking at length with him, I would personally allow myself to do that. You know, I, I would still like to see the UFO myself, or you know, maybe I wouldn't, but I find him completely trustworthy. And under the circumstances he describes, I find his justification for not taking a picture of the first UFO to be entirely credible, as disappointing as that lack of reaction to seeing a UFO is for many of us. Um, it, that does seem to be our immediate reaction to a lot of things is to take out our phones and take a picture of it. But seeing something like that, I'm, I'm not certain what I would do. I don't, I don't think any of us are. I mean, certainly the number of other experiences that have been explained in the Smoke Pit series, whether it's a UFO, a light, a small orb, or, or a light, or a triangular formation of lights or something, you know, I can understand that, oh yeah, you would have taken a picture if it was real, you're just making it up. I, I can understand that response, but honestly, how many times do you see something that bizarre and and not take a moment to try and figure out what it is you're looking at? So I, I can find his explanation to be entirely believable and credible. His son was running late for school, and he had somewhere to be, and of course he's seeing something bizarre, but... It just doesn't occur to him as something he needs to stop the car and take a picture. Uh, I get that. And I've also found a research article titled Incommensurability, Orthodoxy, and the Physics of High Strangeness, a six-layer model for anomalous phenomena by J.F. Valley and E.W. Davis, written in 2004, which summarizes at that point the collective works on UFOlogy and the then-current NIDS database. Chad's behavior during his first observation does match the author's findings about both the psychological and possibly even the psychic effects described by other UFO witnesses with regard to the premonitory dream Chad apparently had prior to seeing the first UFO near his home. Now, this next bit might simply be an effect of the camera lens or simply the pixelation for all I know. But Chad spoke about a haze enveloping the first object, what he said might be the craft disrupting the gravitational field around it. I have since taken the time to watch various interviews with Bob Lazar and to hear him describe his experience with UFOs. As someone who had no reason to believe in any of this before now, I, I dare say I'm finding it exceedingly difficult to deny the existence of this gravitational technology and, of course, of UFOs. And looking at this photo, it might be nothing, but I can't help but notice that there is a slight outline around the object he photographed. And when I invert the photo's color spectrum, it becomes much more distinguishable, what appears to be an equally uniform shroud or outline that surrounds the entire object. Taking all of this into account and then looking back on Chad's bizarre story as being believable, I was certainly intrigued. If 
got a little bit freaked out. I certainly can't say that I would have come to the same conclusion about what his dream meant, and that aliens are coming here to attack us, but even if we do allow ourselves to believe that his dream was a message or warning of some kind, and not just a dream, my own study of dreams tells me that if they mean anything, they're not always so literal. They can be, and I'm not an expert, but the research I've read would indicate that dreams often seem to be a metaphorical experience, or figurative in their meaning rather than literal. A dream about being chased or experiencing intense fear might be related to real anxiety that you're suffering from, uh, stress from overwork, or relationship concerns. That, or it could be caused by substance abuse, uh, or possibly even an unknown medical condition, such as a heart condition, that the dreamer may not even be aware of. I've personally had at least several dreams over the last decade where my teeth start falling out. And at one point, my dentist remarked that I might be grinding my teeth in my sleep. So I kind of put two and two together and thought, you know, maybe I was experiencing tooth pain and therefore I had a dream about where my teeth were falling out. And yet some studies would indicate that having dreams about teeth are a symptom of depression, anxiety, helplessness, and loss of control over my life. Oh boy. Uh, there's just so many possible contributing factors to consider, and it's not an exact science, obviously. Uh, but then, if I had a dream about aliens and UFOs, and then woke up to see an actual UFO hovering near my house, I would have a hard time not believing the two were somehow related, like Chad said. Whatever the case, I emailed Chad back to ask some clarifying questions about his story. After a bit of back and forth, I decided it would be more productive to speak with him over the phone and ask if he would be comfortable doing so. He gave me his number, and we ended up speaking at length. And honestly, as far as what anyone can tell from talking to a person versus reading their emails, uh, because his emails did come off very bizarre without any kind of context about who this guy was, he sounded very down-to-earth, rational, and level-headed. He says he worked for a bank for a long time, and, and certainly over the phone, he seemed much more like a guy I would be comfortable talking to about my finances rather than about bizarre dreams and UFOs. I'm still not sure what to think of his story, but perhaps as UFO sightings, very loud metallic sounds of horns or trumpets coming from the sky in various parts of the world, and other strange events become more common to hear about, maybe that's the point. Stories about these types of phenomena are simply becoming more believable than they once were, whatever the reasons are. During the conversation I had with Chad, I told him that his experiences, as well as his discomforting theory about why these things were happening, reminded me of a Twilight Zone episode titled To Serve Man. In that fictional story, an alien race of giant men come to Earth promising to help humanity with their advanced technology and to cure all disease and hunger. But by the end of the story, their real intentions are made clear, and by that point, they had successfully deceived nearly all of mankind into trusting them and boarding their alien ships to take them to a life of paradise on another planet. And while they always said their honest intention was to serve man, they had actually meant to serve them as food. Chad kind of laughed and agreed that did sound similar to his dream. So, if his dream comes true, and it turns out to be a true premonition, then perhaps Rod Serling was just ahead of his time. Since we discussed more than what he emailed me, I did end up transcribing a lot of what he said in that phone conversation into the script for the episode, uh, organizing that in addition to what he wrote in his emails. As Chad himself welcomes criticism of his story, I certainly welcome you to point out any contradictions that I might have missed and for you to ask any questions you have. Now, on that note, I should make it very clear that while I certainly hope to never receive a made-up story, I see no reason to ridicule anyone for doing so. In my experience, disrespecting someone never causes them to admit to anything or to learn from their mistakes. We all have our reasons for doing the things we do. I have been guilty of sleeping in and showing up late for work and then attempting to convince my first sergeant that he clearly missed running into the same traffic jam that I had. 
If I find contradictions in a story, I do not immediately see that as a cause to discredit everything someone has told me. Maybe they just misremembered something, or were neglected to include every minute detail. My memory is certainly not a steel trap either, and I have likely misrepresented the most mundane details when trying to talk about something that happened to me a few weeks ago, let alone years or even decades ago. Many of my viewers have helpfully pointed out errors in the videos I make, whether historical facts or grammatical errors. I appreciate being given the opportunity to correct my mistakes, and I try to extend that same grace to others. In the end, if someone seeks to make me look foolish by lying to me, or to any of us, so be it. I expect their punishment is ultimately having to live with the truth. If I have questions about their story, I will simply ask for an explanation and give them an opportunity to answer those questions. And if their answers to the questions don't make sense or they contradict other parts of the story or they contradict reality, actual known facts about places and locations or dates and things like that, well, you'll probably never see that story because I'm not going to spend time working on an episode with a story that I at least don't have kind of a warm and fuzzy that as bizarre as it might be, it's believable versus being, okay, this guy's clearly trying to, to pull a fast one. I haven't had anything happen like that yet. Um, but if it ever does, just rest assured, you'll never see that episode. And in the end, if one slips through the cracks, it is up to each of us, the individual, to discern the truth for ourselves. Thank you all for watching. If you also have a story to share with us, you are welcome to post it in the comment section or to email me at wartimestories.yt at gmail.com. I do work alone on the channel, so I will get back to you as quickly as I can. But in any case, whether in dreams or reality or somewhere in between, I will see you in the next episode.